Hello, young Star Trek fans. Got another uh, choose your own adventure style book called Star Trek II Distress Call. And uh, as always, this may be short if I mess it up, and it may be longer if I don't. So let's see if I can draw upon all my knowledge from Starfleet Academy to make it through this book. All right. Captain's Log, Stardate 8001.4. The USS Enterprise on routine patrol has received a distress call from the vicinity of Varda 3, and we are responding as interplanetary law requires. Admiral James T. Kirk, commanding. Mr. Spock? Yes, Captain. A lean, dark science officer turned toward the commander and raised his pointed eyebrows. What do we know of this Varda 3? Kirk asked, knowing that the Vulcan would have retrieved the information from the ship's computer once a distress call had been received. An Earth-type planet within five points of Terran norm, Spock said. It is believed to have once been the base for a species of space-traveling humanoids, now thought extinct. The call could only have come from an archaeological team from Luna University who are conducting a dig there. Kirk frowned and rubbed his jaw. Pretty far out, aren't they? Not unusual for such research teams, Spock responded. Turn to page two. Lieutenant Hoor, keep trying to raise them, Kirk said. Aye, sir, but their fading call indicated either a power failure or, she hesitated, or interference. Kirk thumbed his command intercom. Lieutenant Commander Chekhov to the bridge. In a few moments, the elevator door hissed open and Pavel Chekhov walked quickly to Kirk's position. Captain, he said briskly. Mr. Chekhov, prepare a team of six security men and a medical assistant for planet fall in, he looked at a clock, two hours. Kirk looked at Spock. Any precautions needed? Spock shook his head. No, Captain, at least none are indicated. His eyebrows went up. But I should point out that there must be some reason for the distress call. Kirk nodded and gestured to check off. Go armed and alert and keep in touch. Yes, Captain, the young officer replied. He turned briskly and strode into the elevator. He did not smile until the doors had closed behind him. Then a happy smile broke across his face. Action, he thought. My own command on an unknown planet. All right. If you follow Chekhov directly to the surface of Barda 3, turn to page 3. If you first reconnoiter the planet, turn to page 4. Uh, well, let, let's go with Chekhov. I mean, that's where, that's where he's going. So. Okay, so Chekhov used Spock's life form readings as a target and brought the shuttlecraft directly down toward the crescent of green along one of the many oceans. The security men tumbled from the spacecraft and set up a defensive perimeter. Starfleet had long ago determined that there was danger in even the most innocent appearing of alien planets and had prescribed certain precautions. The jungle was a tangled web of tubular plants, each fighting for precious water and sunlight. Leaving two men on guard, Chekhov took the rest of the landing party through the jungle toward the spot indicated by the lifeform readings. They emerged into a man-made clearing and saw the domes of the Terran archaeological team near the sharp angles of the star-shaped buildings they were excavating. Medic Narva Mokhtar pointed out an entrance in the structure and suggested they investigate. All right, do we go immediately into the star-shaped building or do we look around a bit? Well, I say we go into the building. I mean, that's, that's the best chance of finding people if they're going to be anywhere. So we have to turn to page six, which is these are said than done with these old pages. This is like from 1982. Okay, so Chekhov watched with admiration as the lithe, dark-skinned Narva Mokhtar strode ahead, her large, liquid eyes alert. She was from the same Terran nation as his old shipmate, Nyoto Hura, the United States of Africa, but not from the same area. She was a good medic which was why he had chosen her from the several Dr. McCoy had suggested. But he also knew she had, in American terminology, a good head on her shoulders. <clears throat> they entered the passageway and turned on their lights. Cold stone ravaged by the ages formed the corridor. It was almost featureless at first, but soon they came upon a mural carved into the stone, then another. The passage slanted down and they followed it. Chekhov unaccountably felt a quiver of fear. There was something about this long, dead temple or building or whatever it was that made him uneasy. Sir, the security man in the lead called out. Look at this. Chekhov hurried ahead. What he saw made his eyes widen. In niches built into the ancient wall were nine human beings. They stood erect, their hands at their sides, eyes closed. They were dressed in, 
in worn Luna University jumpsuits. Okay, if you want to look around before rescuing the scientists, go to page 14. If you're in a hurry to rescue them first, proceed to page 15. Well, looks like they've been there for a while, so let's take a look around page 14. Commander Chekhov, Narva Mokhtar said, pointing, pointing down her light beam. Chekhov blinked in surprise. There were more niches in the wall, as far as her beams shone. A few were empty, but most were filled. A figure stood in each niche, seemingly dead on his or her feet. Chekhov recognized two Klingons and a Romulan at once, then a hairless Delton. Two Vulcans were opposite, a plant-like Phylon, and four Dolmen, two Argelians, and an armored Thrix. At the edge of the beams, Chekhov could just make out several blue-skinned Andorians, their white hair gleaming in the light. It's, it's a museum, breathed Narva Mokhtar. Are they alive? Chekhov asked intently. Mokhtar ran her sensor over the first figure, a bearded man in his middle years, then nodded. She went down the line, then tested the Klingons. All alive, Mr. Chekhov, but in stasis. Okay, if you believe Chekhov can break the stasis, go to page 26. If you think you might have difficulty, go to page 27. Uh, you know, he, he's in command, so I say we go with him. So I'm going to page 26. He is in command. And if we're making the decisions, kind of strange. Anyway, Chekhov flipped open his communicator. Chekhov to Enterprise, Captain Kirk responded, and Chekhov filled him in on what had been found. We'll lock on your coordinates, Kirk said, and beam them up. Better have security ready in the transporter room, Captain, Chekhov said. There are Klingons and a Romulan here. We'll bring them up six at a time, and I've dealt with Klingons before, Mr. Chekhov. Chekhov turned and saw the first six of the scientists dissolve in a glitter cascade of light, then disappear completely. Proceed to page 46. All right, well, okay, 46 it is. In the transport room of the Federation ship, medics took the last of the Luna University scientists off to sickbay. Dr. McCoy thumbed a wall communicator. Admiral Kirk? Kirk here. What's the prognosis, Bones? A simple stasis I can break down with neurolazine, Captain, but what put them into it? I'm going down to find out. Be careful, Jim, McCoy said. I'm always careful, Admiral Kirk said with a smile in his voice. McCoy punched the communicator and grumbled noisily. Oh, sure, all the time. He loves that bridge and he hates not being where the action is. He'll be the death of me. All right, proceed to page 63. Three. Hey, we've been doing pretty well so far. If you're snorting, that's just my cat. Okay. Captain Kirk and his team materialized outside the alien structure and looked around. There was always something different and exciting about breathing the air of an alien planet. He had never gotten used to it and had never ceased to be excited by it. This was a fragrant planet, he thought, smelling of spice and flowers. Then he gestured at Sulu and the security detail he'd brought down with him. Mr. Sulu, take half the team and enter the passage on the left. Keep in touch. Aye, sir, Sulu gestured and marched off. Kirk could barely restrain a smile as he entered the right-hand passage. Sticking his nose into the unknown was one of his greatest thrills. Not even attaining Admiral's rank had dulled that feeling, he thought. I missed it. I should get back to it. Kirk and his half of the security team moved ahead. Oh, look. Kitty's got to check out the uh, ten, new 10 forward. Oh, jeez. Yeah, just, just don't eat it, okay, Kitty? Okay. Hey, what are you doing? You just knocked him over. Okay, it doesn't matter. All right, uh, if you want to follow Captain Kirk, proceed to page 80. If, just, if you desire to follow Sue, no, I'm going with Captain Kirk. I'm going with Captain Kirk. The stone corridor seemed endless, dark, dank, and mysterious. It went on forever, twisting and turning, slanting down, going up. Then they heard a slithering, and they all took a tighter grip on their phasers. They found the guardian, or it found them, as they rounded a turning. It filled the corridor, floor to ceiling and side to side, a thick, sluggish wall of wet grayness. But even as they watched, it began to change shape and color. One of the security men gasped as a human being seemed to step through the grayness, it seemed to gain color in moments, first in the flesh of the face, then in the details of the clothing it wore. 
A United Federation of Planets Starfleet uniform was colored in as they watched, an exact replica of the ones they wore, complete with admiral stripes and the face of James Tiberius Kirk. Kirk, the real Kirk, noticed that a thin string of gray still reached from the duplicate's back to the hall, to the hall filling mass behind it. Who are you? Kirk asked. I am the protector. I understand, Kirk said slowly. We did not mean to intrude, but only to rescue those whom you have um, put in stasis. Okay, continue the next page. They were invaders. Kirk found it eerie to talk to a blank-faced replica of himself. You may remove them. We have, Kirk said. May I ask what you're protecting? I protect my masters. The people you imprisoned were seekers of knowledge. They meant no harm. Yes. Kirk didn't know what to say next. Do you have any knowledge your masters did not specifically tell you to protect? He asked. No, I protect all. Kirk nodded. We did not wish to interfere. We will go now, if you'll permit us. Kirk pulled out his communicator and spoke softly into it. Scotty, prepare to beam us up. Aye, sir. Is there anything you need? Anything we can do for you? No. Kirk nodded. We'll leave you to your job then. Scotty, we're ready. Kirk watched his duplicated self step back, and he trembled as he saw the figure being absorbed into the mass. Yes, he murmured. Stand guard. Go to page 91. You know, we're doing really well on this one. No, I shouldn't have said that. <sighs> back on the bridge of the Enterprise, Admiral Kirk pressed the stud to activate the log. Captain's log, start at 8001.5. We have rescued the archaeologists from a stasis trap on Varda 3 and are proceeding to Starbase 6. Also recovered were a number of space travelers, including a real-life Thrix, which Dr. McCoy says is a living fossil. Kirk out. Kirk settled back into his chair and watched the stars begin to blur as they went into warp drive. A good day's work, he thought. And, hey, you know, that was a good ending. We did a good job. And there's Kitty playing with 10 forward. Yeah, she loves new stuff. All right, well, this is Daddy Star Trek. Till next time, signing off.